So today we're going to be looking at a slightly longer view of uh, what we call the uh, of agrarian relations in Pakistan. And we're going to be focusing on two main things, the Green Revolution, how it transformed uh, agriculture in Pakistan. And in the light of the Green Revolution, we're going to look, be looking at uh, uh, land reforms, Bhutto's land reforms. And then we will conclude by looking at how Ziya's Islamization um, stopped those particular land reforms. So what is the Green Revolution? Well, to begin with, it is considered a watershed moment for Pakistani agriculture because it leads to such a dramatic transformation in the way in which agriculture is occurring. It's essentially a technology package, which I'll discuss with you in just a bit. Now, to, to, to see the impact of the Green Revolution, I put together these stats for you. Uh, in nine, between 1949 and 1958, that is the first decade after independence, agriculture was growing at zero, oh, sorry, 1.43%, so a very slow rate of growth. And this is also the period where population is growing at about 3%. So you can see that agriculture is actually growing slower than population growth rates. But with the advent of the Green Revolution technology, the new technology package, we suddenly see that the growth rate in agriculture jumps from 1.43% to 3.7%. Very, very dramatic transformation. And if you look at the same transition from the mid-1960s to the 1970s, you see that agriculture grows at 6.3%. Now, this is an astoundingly high rate of growth for agriculture especially, although industry can easily grow at 6%, 5%. But for agriculture to grow at 6.3% is quite phenomenal. And you might be surprised to discover that in certain, uh, certain uh, years, agriculture grew by as much as 11.7% and 9.6%. Now, I cannot emphasize how, uh, how the importance of uh, these growth patterns, because this is a time when Pakistan was primarily uh, or, or almost entirely agricultural. Uh, 70, 80% of people you know, were connected to the agricultural economy. Most people lived in villages, etc. And without the modernization and transformation of agriculture, it would not be possible to modernize and transform the Pakistani political economy as a whole. So this is really quite, quite phenomenal in terms of uh, the structural transformation. Now the background to the Green Revolution is that in 1949, the People's Republic of China had become independent and had undertaken vast, one of the largest land reforms you can think of in, in Asia. Uh, arguably even in history in terms of the number of people that it impacted. And this led in turn, of course, to, uh, uh, well, not only to North Korea, but even to South Korea undertaking land reforms and many other East Asian countries undertaking land reforms. Nehru in the 1950s uh, sent a delegation of people to the People's Republic of China to study what they had done with respect to land reforms, and he also decided in the 1950s that India would undertake a land reform. He says, I think nothing has happened in any country in the world during the last few years so big in content and so revolutionary in design as the community projects in India. They are changing the face of rural India. These community projects were mainly inspired by uh, the kind of projects that were occurring in the People's Republic of China. Did, you know, what, did Nehru's optimistic portrayal here, here bear out? That's a separate question. Uh, perhaps not. But, um, um, but the idea, the general idea was that they wanted to create an atmosphere favorable to the formation of agrarian cooperatives. The atmosphere should be one of equality and non-exploitation. And in creating such an atmosphere, land reforms will play a vital role. Uh, Daniel Thorner wrote that the power of the village oligarch must be broken and the government must become an instrument of the ordinary people. Progress could not be achieved without a major assault on landlords. So this particular point of view was quite dominant, not just, of course, in uh, China and other countries that had come under left-wing governments, but also in India and many other parts of the world. <coughs> So India underwent vast, massive land reforms to break the power of the landed oligarchy, etc. And soon afterwards, Pakistan also followed suit. In both India and Pakistan, the way in which these land reforms and agrarian transformation began was under the slogan of the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution at the international level was meant to counter the Red Revolution. 
The Red Revolution, of course, was a socialist, communist sort of uh, transformation of the agrarian countryside, it's essentially a peasant uh, re revolution against the landlords. And the Green Revel uh, and what that had done in Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, China, Korea, etc., was that it had brought to power left-wing governments, governments that were generally uh, found, did not find favor, uh, especially with the U.S. government, etc., or Western governments as a whole. So uh, the Ford Foundation sponsored a very important program where they began to look at technology uh, and ways through which they could address the problems of the poorer peasants um, without this dramatic revolutionary transformation. And this was very much part of US foreign policy at the time, because uh, US foreign policy at the time and, and the foreign policy of most European countries was tailored to the goal of containing communism. It should not spread further than, it, than where it had already spread. So, so the Green Revolution was very much part of the strategy of the containment of communism. What was it? It was the introduction of, um, uh, of the following things, fertilizers, uh, new high yield variety seeds, tube wells, developing the water infrastructure, farm machinery, mechanization, especially tractors, etc., and providing credit. Now, the goal here was, of course, that, the, uh, that it, within the agrarian political economy, especially of South Asia, poorer people would grow, uh, would, would, ha would become more prosperous, and therefore the appeal of the left would be diminished. So let's look at each of the, this particular technology package, uh, breaking it down a little bit. Between 1961 and 65, 25,000 tube wells were installed in Pakistan. Between 65 and 70, uh, tube wells increased from 34,000 to 79,000. And the area serviced uh, 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 also increased sixfold. By 1970, tube wells irrigated more than half of all the irrigated area in the country. Today, of course, it's even more than that. So this, is, this represents a very important technological change in the way agriculture is occurring in Pakistan before and after the Green Revolution. Before the Green Revolution, agriculture is mainly uh, irrigated through canal irrigation, which was built in the 1920s um, by the British, etc., and of course maintained by the Pakistani government. But after the Green Revolution, now the emphasis, or, or you know, the the uh, your uh, rural countryside, you know, peasants are using tube wells much more than they are use, utilizing canal irrigation. But these tube wells were also concentrated in certain areas. So 91% of tube wells were in the Punjab in 1968. That's a very, very, very high number. So tube well irrigation is basically, was basically uh, mainly a Punjab phenomenon. Why is this the case now? Of course, um, from the point of view of the Baloch, they may think that this, the, the, the real reason is that Punjab has monopolized all the uh, the resources and so on and so forth, but there were also other geographical reasons such as the fact that the water level is much lower, the ground is much harder in most of, most of Balochistan. Digging a tube well all the way down to the water table is actually much more expensive in Balochistan than it is in Punjab. And uh, similar reasons were, you know, are present for, um, uh, for Sindh, which is that because Sindh is closer to the sea, the salt of the sea comes into the uh, to, the, to the underground water, making the underground water quite saline and therefore not really, um, uh, you know, it's not really economically viable uh, to dig a tube well, etc. Now, the other major interesting thing is that 70% of tube wells were put in by farmers owning over uh, 25%, uh, 25 acres of land. And if you recall from earlier statistics, about 80 to 90% of farmers own less than 25 acres of land. So this is really the top 10% of people, at the most 20% of the people of the agrarian political economy that are installing tube wells. It's not the poorest, it's not the majority thing. The, uh, the next major component of the Green Revolution are tractors. In 1959, there were 2,000 tractors. Uh, by 68, there are now almost 19,000 tractors. Uh, but tractorization, and mostly Pakistan imported or, or then made later manufactured large, heavy tractors, because there's large and middle and small tractors. We'll use large tractors, because large tractors can do the work of small tractors, and small tractors can't do the work of large tractors, etc. But again, tractors were also 
uh, owned and focused in a few areas. 38% of all tractors were located just in the Multan division. This is not in the city, but in obviously um, the division. 58% in Lahore, Multan, and Bahawalpur combined. So about 60% of the tractors of Pakistan in 1970 were just in three districts of the Punjab. That's a very high concentration in just a few parts of the country. And moreover, 75% uh, of privately owned tractors were on the farms that had also sunk tube wells. So, uh, two, you know, so what that means is if three-fourths of all the tractors are in the same farms, where you have you know, 70, 80% of the tube wells, then you can understand that tube well and tractorization was basically a phenomena which was focused and concentrated in the upper uh, sections of the agrarian political economy. Next up was introduced the high yield variety seeds and together with them fertilizers and chemical pesticides, etc. Um, the International Rice Research Institute, Institute in the uh, Philippines created the IRRI rice seed and the, Mex and the International Wheat and Maize Institute in Mexico created the Mexipac seed. O much of this research, if not nearly all of it, was funded by, as I told you, the Ford Foundation. Um, and when these uh, new seeds were planted in Pakistan, uh, the result <coughs> was startling in terms of productivity, certainly. Uh, wheat production increased by 91%, that's almost double. Rice production increased by 141% between 1960 and 1970. This is the key period of the Green Revolution, 1960 to 1970 is where Pakistan's Green Revolution really takes off. Takes off. And similarly, you can see fertilizer consumption also increases by 150%. Here you have a large fertilizer plant. So, uh, and pesticides similarly. Now, the result of the Green Revolution is very clear in terms of output, that output is really growing by leaps and bounds, there's no doubt about that. But um, over time, and especially in the 1970s, people became more and more critical of the Green Revolution, and the main area of their criticism was that the Green Revolution contributed to, contributed to regional and class disparities. So you have Hamza Alvi, Muazzam Mahmood, Mahmood Hassan Khan, Karl Gotch, and many others, etc. And what they point out uh, is that Faisalabad, Sahiwal, Multan grew at 8.9% between 60 and 65, and other districts and regions were left behind. Even inside the Punjab, the, uh, obviously this is a period where you have East and West Pakistan, so a lot of this is focused in West Pakistan, but even in West Pakistan, most of it is focused in Punjab, but even within Punjab, most of it is focused within three or four main districts of Punjab, not everywhere in the Punjab. So this is now referred to by Akmal Hussain, uh, Akmal Hussain, very important economist who's written uh, a whole load, he calls this the elite farmer strategy. Um, whereas Shahid Javed Barki is of the opinion that mainly um, the Green Revolution occurred in farmers that had between 50 and 100 acres. So this is one big debate that uh, exists both in India as well as in Pakistan. Who were the primary beneficiaries of the Green Revolution? Was it really the biggest landlords like Peer Pagada over here, etc., or was it this new uh, class of uh, capitalist farmers that owned between 50 and 100 acres, right? So, um, as, you, as I said, Akmal Hussain and Hamza Alvi and others think that the, those farmers that had over 100 acres were the dominant farmers with respect to the Green Revolution. They benefited the most. Now, the thing to understand, this is very important, is that this kind of new technology, Green Revolution technology, and technology generally, is not scale neutral. I think this is, this is one of the key things about this form of industrialization. It's not scale neutral. What that means is that you have to have at least 64 acres of land in, let's say, Sindh, and about 50 acres of land in, let's say, Punjab, because Punjabi land is much more fertile, etc. in order for green revolution technology to be economically viable. You can't, have a, you can't buy a tractor if you have 25 acres of land. It's not going to be economically viable for you because you don't have enough land to be able to really fully utilize that tractor in the way that you need to utilize it. So the number of such farms that are above you know, 50 acres, 60 acres, etc., are only 2% of all farms. So given that the technology is not scale neutral, only the top 2% uh, uh, you know, uh, of farms are really able to 
utilize that technology, uh, etc. So, whatever, whichever way you look at this debate, whether you agree with uh, Barki or you agree with Hussein, all everybody agrees that all everybody that, that has written on the Green Revolution agrees that the Green Revolution enormously accelerates capitalist relations in agriculture. There's an enormous increase in productivity, uh, a more than proportionate increase in marketable surplus. So while output is going up, the percentage of that output which is being put into the market is going up by even more, right? So people are actually putting more and more into the market. Tractor use went up more than five times, diesel electric pumps uh, five times again, tube wells 38 times, fertilizer nine times, the area under the new high yield variety increases 11 times, there's increase in cash incomes of landlords, uh, landowners, there's decrease in real incomes of small farmers simultaneously though, even though overall prosperity is increasing. There's also distressed sales of land and intensification of land inequality as a consequence of the Green Revolution. And there's also pauperization and even eviction, large-scale eviction of sharecroppers, etc. Because now you have, now that agriculture has become so profitable and lucrative, you don't want to give it out to somebody, you don't want to rent it out to somebody else to farm on your behalf. Rather, you take ownership of that farm and you hire wage laborers to do that work for you because it's all become more capitalist in that way as well. So permanent wage labor declines, but seasonal wage labor goes up. Um, uh, so anyway, so the result, of course, is increasing class inequity as a consequence of the Green Revolution. We see the displacement of labor, and we see also a lot of rural-urban migration. So as labor becomes superfluous in, the, in agriculture, lo, lo, you know, the, we have really hundreds of thousands of people, even millions of people, moving into cities. So cities expand dramatically in this period. We also have the growth of consumerism because the amount of income at the disposal of the economy is much larger. So you see a lot more consumerism. And the growth of small towns. So remember when I told you in the first lecture that you know Punjab is 70% now uh, in small towns and urban areas? So one of the key factors that cause that, as opposed to other parts of P Pakistan, is really the Green Revolution. So one of the key factors that causes Punjab to ur urbanize much faster than others is really the Green Revolution. It also changes people's uh, attitude towards education because, you know, if you look at the data, it is true that uh, education and agricultural output were not strongly correlated before the Green Revolution. So somebody who was not necessarily well educated could do as well as somebody who's highly educated in agriculture as long as they understood how to do kheti bari, how to, you know, till the soil, etc. right? So your education, if you have a lums degree, doesn't mean, didn't mean before the 1960s that you were a better agriculturalist. But with the Green Revolution and, and agriculture now becoming more dependent on technology, farmers and peasants, etc., also began to recognize uh, that, you know, um, if, uh, if they were well-educated, they could apply for credit, they could, uh, you know, buy tractors, learn how to use them, uh, diesel pumps, uh, tube wells, all of these things require some basic degree, let's say, of education. So that was one social change, positive, I think, that came about. And here's the most interesting thing, is that the class differences in the Punjab is the central reason for the popularity and victory in 1970 of the People's Party in the Punjab. The poorer segments, those who lost out as a consequence of the Green Revolution, were the ones that were most likely to vote for the PPP in the Punjab because the PPP, of course, promised land reforms. So the Green Revolution not only causes these massive structural transformations, which are very, very important, but it also causes that those structural transformations in turn also cause massive political transformations at the national level. And this, I think, is one of the very, 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 very important uh, you know, things to understand about political economy, that whereas we may think of the, let's say, PTI phenomena as being an epiphenomena, you know, sort of, we might not link it to deeper structural changes. The rise of the People's Party, we might think of it as a, you know, Bhutto, as a result of Bhutto's charisma. But in fact, the formation of new political parties is often preceded by or goes side by side with 
very, very massive big changes in the structure of the political economy, thereby creating new constituencies for a new kind of politics. The PTI constituency, for example, is, I think it's well uh, understood, is largely, very largely an urban constituency, um, whereas the other older political parties, PMLN, and uh, especially PPP, were much more stronger in rural areas, right? And in much the same way, the politics before the 1970s, dominated by the Muslim League and other sort of parties, now with the emerge, uh, National Army Party behind, there's JUI and many other parties, etc. But now the sudden dramatic rise of the PPP is mainly um, people, uh, you know, have uh, uh, highly correlated with areas in which the Green Revolution was strongest. So areas, districts in which the Green Revolution was the quickest and was the, you know, spread the most are actually the districts in which the People's Party voter was created. Now, if we go back in time to examine what the Muslim League was all about, if we want to look at sort of uh, agriculture in the longer view of history, uh, there are many people, of course, who allege or, or, or say that Muslim League was essentially a party uh, in the 1940s, etc., of landlords, especially after the Sikandar uh, Jinnah Pact. Um, uh, so after that particular pact, 1935, when the big landlords of Punjab and Sindh, who were originally part of the Unionist Party, they switch over to the Muslim League and become highly influential. And Muslim League doesn't become successful as a political party till the, uh, you know, Sir Sikandar Hayat and Jinnah Pact. Usse uh, pehle, all the elections in which the Muslim League stands, it doesn't gain any significant vote at all. So in um, 1942, 163 of the 503 Muslim League parliamentary members were big, major landlords. The Central Council of the Muslim League in 1947, uh, landlord councilmen from Punjab and Sindh were 50 and 60 percent respectively, very, very high. All chief ministers of the Punjab, Sindh, and KPK were big landlords. Sometimes I'm using KPK, sometimes I'm using NWFP. When I'm quoting, I'm using NWFP because that's how it was called back then. Uh, in the provincial elections in Punjab in 1951, landlords won 80% of the seats. Provincial elections of 1953 in Sindh, landlords won 90% of the seats. So highly dom Pakistani politics before the 1970s, highly dominated in the rural area especially by landlords. Now, along comes Ayub Khan, and you may recognize that, that's Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, who was his foreign minister and very, uh, you know, close to Ayub at the time. So when Ayub came, comes to power, he, you know, examining what's going on in India and examining what's going on in the world, because this is a worldwide trend now across Asia, except, you know, newly independent countries are undertaking land reforms and, uh, you know, either they're going the path of the Red Revolution or they're going the path of the Green Revolution. So Yub Khan comes to power and declares a ceiling of 500 acres for irrigated land and 1,000 acres for non-irrigated land. That's a very, very high ceiling. Okay? Uh, to give you some estimate of the size of the, ce the ceiling, um, you need, if you have 500 acres, you need a minimum of 500 workers to work that land. You cannot have less than 500 workers to work 500. If you have 1,000 acres, you need a minimum of 1,000 workers to work your land. So these are pretty large scale sort of enterprises. Um, so, uh, obviously, as technology, uh, as technology more and more improves, you need less and less workers to work more and more land, but that's the rule of thumb. So, uh, approximately 6,000 owners at the, in the 1950s owned more than the ceiling. They constituted only 0.1% of, of all owners, but had more than 15% of the land. Um, so government also offered them compensation between one and five rupees uh, per uh, produce index unit and also gave them government bonds, etc. But the choice was up to the landlord what section of the land he was going to give. So they mostly gave, you know, uh, hills and desert sort of areas that were difficult to cultivate. Uh, by 1967, only 50% of the resumed land had been sold. So most of the land continued to belong to the, they had taken this land, but they hadn't really given it to anyone. They'd only given half of it, sold half of it to other people. And only 20% of the land that the government had taken was sold to the landless. So most was auctioned to rich people. Uh, and also a lot of it was given to uh, retired bureaucrats as well as retired army officers. This is where, well, it was older than this, the tradition, but uh, 
a lot of the land that uh, military officers get was taken over by the government in this particular area time period. And you saw that, in fact, Bhutto's land reform also utilized a lot of land that was taken over in the 1959 land reforms. So uh, or, together with the 1959 land, land reforms, Jagirdari was declared illegal. 0 0.9 million acres were declared Jagir lands and therefore taken by the government. And one third was, in fact, of that land was, in fact, resumed by the government. Mehmood Hasan Khan says that the 1959 reforms left so many open uh, exceptions that, in fact, if you look at the de facto ceiling in PIUs, it's, it's, it's almost 7,500 acres in the Punjab and 1,660 acres, let's say, in Sindh. The average, like, 4,000 acres. So you can potentially have 4,000 acres, even, you know, uh, 7,000 acres in the Punjab and get away from the la You don't have to be... You won't come under the land reform regime if you get it assessed in the PIU, through the PIUs, etc. That's the produce index unit. So along comes People's Party, and it's, uh, it claims that it stands for the elimination of feudalism. The People's Party claimed that these land reforms, their land reforms, would restore the dignity and self-respect to the oppressed rural masses and provide for their salvation. They would crush the power of the opulent feudal lords and facilitate the modernization of agriculture. मैंने इनकलाबी तब्दीली लाई है इसको मैंने मुल्क में आवाम के जहन में तब्दील लाई मैं खुद जमींदार मैं जानता हूं कि किस हद तक मैंने किसानों और मुजाहरों और हारियों के जहनियत में तब्दीली लाई ये इस बहुत बड़ी फता है और भी अगर इसलाहत ना होते ये भी बहुत ही बड़ी बात है आवाम मजदूरों के सिर्फ so after Bhutto was overthrown, you can see he was massively, massively popular. But the popularity isn't, uh, isn't the result of uh, his, uh, as we often think, isn't the result of his phenomenal rhetoric or his, uh, or his, um, uh, his speeches, etc. His speeches are quite emotional, no doubt about that. But it's much more the content. I mean, you can see he's making grammatical mistakes in Urdu even, right? So the, the, it's not his eloquence so much as the program that he's presenting uh, which makes him a very popular uh, uh, politician. So Bhutto is overthrown in 1977, and uh, Ziaul Haq uh, comes to power uh, with a military coup and takes out this paper called a White Paper on the Performance of the Bhutto Regime. Uh, that's volume three of it over there, in which he alleges that uh, the Bhutto government's land reform program was another example of cynical posturing, favoritism, victimization, and and corruption and abuse of power. Hence that it was, uh, it should be declared null, void, etc, etc. Mr. Bhutto ki hukumat khatam ho chuki hai. Sare mulk mein mashallah nafiz kar diya gaya hai. Qaumi aur subai assemblyaan tord di gai hai. Subai governor aur wazir hata diya gai hai. Albatta ayin ko mansukh nahi kiya gaya hai. Iske baaz hisso par amal daramad I think it will not be right to, uh, for any person to say that it wasn't a fair trial. I would say it was as fair, in fact, more than a fair trial that any trial would be. I think the question on everyone's minds is, will Mr. Bhutto be hanged? All I will stress on this, that uh, justice must be done. And nobody is above the law according to my conviction. 
whether it is Mr. A, Mr. B, or General Ziaul Haq himself, and justice must be done. It's unfortunate that the person who is involved in this case, who has been convicted, the former Prime Minister, happened to be a politician. He happened to be the former Prime Minister of Pakistan. He happened to be the chairman of the, of the People's Party. But that does not make him or anybody else above the law. Do you think that the very fact that you have a military government at the moment in Pakistan would influence the courts, must influence them? No, we can't. As I said before you, that although uh, this is supposed to be a military government, but uh, we have not abrogated the constitution. The constitution is still in, uh, technically speaking, held in abeyance. But we are following it to assume that just because there happened to be a martial law, the military government can or will influence the court is totally wrong. They are, uh, they are independent and we, uh, we respect their freedom. And I have always said that the judiciary must, have just, must be independent of the executive and they must do what the justice demands. Have you discussed the case with, uh, say, the Supreme Justice? Or? No, sir. It's up to the judges to decide the court. I've read the verdict, yes. But you've not in any way advised, counseled, discussed? It's not done. If it can be done in England, well, I don't know. It's certainly not done here. <laughs> Are you still holding to your idea of having free elections eventually? Sandy, uh, we are committed. We are totally committed to, to revive the democratic procedures in this country. And the first basic step is the elections. And it is my effort, my government's effort, my colleagues' efforts, and uh, except for an odd party, totally we are all endeavoring to create an atmosphere where we could hold free and fair elections. Because the democratic process must have its evolution. Would it be a long way away? Oh, or? no, no. no. We, under, we, don't, we don't intend to stay for years. Months but, rather than years? Yes, it certainly is months. And uh, all I'm looking for is an environment in which to hold the elections. And more than that, to see that the results of the elections are positive. Because elections, for the sake of elections, not the answer. Elections must bring out a positive result in the form of a somewhat stable political government. Acha, acha, why? Why you funny? What happened? When he I suppose. All right. So you see that that sort of ideological divide between Bhutto's People's Party. Uh, supporters on the one hand and Zia's supporters on the other uh, has been very formative of the politics of Pakistan. But independently of how we may feel about uh, the, um, uh, the trial of Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto, the sentencing of Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto, etc., uh, as social scientists we have to also examine what was it that the Bhutto government was trying to do exactly? How radical was it? Um, how what its claims, of course, were, as you heard, uh, very, very radical, that he was going to break not just feudalism, but even break capitalism, right? So, and that he was going to bring about a socialist government. And he's saying that on Pakistan TV, he's saying that on television to the entire country. And believe me, at that time, everybody watched Pakistan TV, so everybody really heard these sort of broadcasts, etc. So, now... Bhutto's chosen policy to undo feudalism is basically to impose a land ceiling. This is a very different policy, let's say, from uh, the policy uh, that, that the left has advocated, that socialists or communists have advocated, which is land to the tiller strategy. Land to the tiller in Punjab is, uh, is the slogan, Jeda Vave Ohi Khave. Right? So if you do not work the land, you should not be owning the land. Those who work the land ought to be owning the land. And in Sin, there's a similar equivalent. Parisa, maybe you can tell us what's the... Uh, okay, never mind. <laughs> All right. So, um, so, um, so land to the tiller strategy obviously eliminates uh, the entire feudal class very, very quickly. But Zulfikar Ali Bhutto did not seek to eradicate the feudals. Uh, in the way that in which the French Revolution eradicated them or other bourgeois democratic revolutions, capitalist democratic revolutions eradicated them. Rather, what he really wanted was selective accommodation and transformation, according to Herring. 
And Bhutto says this himself. He says, I can't nationalize the land. It's not possible. Tomorrow, if someone wants to do it, let him try. At the same time, I can't allow bigger estates to remain. I must cut them down so that production increases and the feudal power is eliminated. The world doesn't come to an end with one reform. If that reform is proper and successful, on that you can build other reforms. But no one can sweep the board clean in one go. Um, so Bhutto enacted regulation, martial law regulation 115. And you might be a bit confused. Why is this a martial law regulation? Wasn't he prime minister of the country? Well, after Yahya Khan resigned, Bhutto was in the unique position of being also the first civilian martial law administrator, as well as the president of Pakistan, which after the creation of the 73 constitution, he gave up and became just the prime minister. So at that time, he was chief martial law administrator, so 1972, so he ha uh, promulgated MLR 115. This becomes one of the key pieces of legislation that we must understand and learn about. And what does it say? It says 150 acres irrigated, 300 acres non-irrigated. That's the ceiling. It's come down. Pele, it's 500 acres for Ayub, and tuck, it's now down to 150. Although exemptions can be made, for example, 50 acres per holding above the ceiling for pay purchase of a tractor or a, or a tube well, uh, there is no compensation or, uh, offered to landlords. Uh, when, you, when the government takes over that land, the government is not paying the landlords for that. And land is, will be given to the tiller free of cost. That's Bhutto's idea, that the landless must inherit that land. And he's not selling it to them, he's giving it to them. This is still a, relatively speaking, high ceiling. About 89-90% of all holdings constitute less than 25 acres in 1972. So 90% of people are actually under 25 acres let alone 150 acres is a, quite a high ceiling still. So the reforms cannot impact, I mean, they're supposed to benefit this 90%. They impact, you know, the elite of the elite in the rural political economy. Uh, but Zulfikar Ali Bhutto also was very mindful uh, that agriculture should continue to be an attractive and profitable vocation. We are as much for the creative and humane landowner as we are for a productive and conscientious owner of industry. So very clear that he's not trying to break capitalism or break uh, you know, feudalism entirely, but he's trying to make it, his, understand, his own understanding is he's trying to make it more productive. Here's a very interesting thing. What, we, what politicians say in English uh, and what politicians say in Urdu, uh, or what they say in their, or, or you know, nationalist, with respect to nationalist politi politicians, what they say in their own language, Pashto, Balochi, or Punjabi, and what they say in Urdu can be two very different things because they're playing to two very different audiences. They're talking to very different audiences. So you have to be very mindful which audience they're talking to. In this particular instance, he's talking to the more in, so, so to the intelligentsia of Pakistan that's reading what Bhutto is really trying to do, what People's Party is really trying to do. So we can understand that this is no, not a comprehensive attack on feudalism, but rather to convert what would be considered parasites into entrepreneurs, arbitrary tyrants to model landlords. This is a very moderate attempt, despite the fact that the rhetoric is extremely radical. Right? So the rhetoric is, we are going to completely finish feudalism and capitalism, but the reality is that actually it's a very moderate reform. <clears throat> All government servants also, who acquired land from 1959, uh, from the 1959 reforms, onto two years of ceasing to be in service, uh, were also required to, uh, to surrender lands in excess of 100 acres. Vakf land, stud farms, and shikargas also all came under now these land reform laws. They were previously exempt from the 1959 land reforms. So how can we, let's take a pause here and try to understand how can we theorize this? How do we understand this in terms of the, the larger theory of political economy? Here, um, the reading resorts to looking at Lenin's idea that there can be different paths to capitalism. A at least Lenin talks about two different paths to capitalism. What he calls capitalism from below and capitalism from above. So capitalism from below is what is referred to as the revolutionary republican path. Capitalism develops from below and then it comes up and it overthrows the state, etc., creating a French revolution-like scenario and uh, society becomes a republic and progresses. Capitalism from above is what happens in Prussia, uh, in, uh, which is also referred to as the Junkers path, who were the um, big landowners, etc., uh, of Germany. And this is that the 
uh, that the landowners themselves transform, metamorphose, so to speak, into becoming, from feudal lords to becoming capitalists. So where do we fit this, uh, 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 what's going on in the Bhutto period? We certainly can't fit it here because this is not some rural revolution against uh, landlords. Uh, the reading suggests that we fit it over here, that the attempt really is to, uh, is to clip the power of feudal lords and therefore transform them into what Bhutto would consider to be productive landowners, etc. One interesting tangent here is that this idea is taken by Barrington Moore Jr. in his famous book, The Social Roots of Dictatorship and Democracy, where he says that societies that underwent this path of transformation became democracies and republics, and societies that underwent this path of transformation ended up becoming, were very, very open to becoming fascist sort of governments. So his whole explanation of why Germany, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and others became fascist and not, didn't become liberal, etc., is that they took this particular path of development rather than the French path of capitalist development. So I pretty much summed it up here. Um, the, the, the capitalist class develops uh, from the bottom up, overthrows the feudal class, class sweeping away the, po the politics, the economics, the culture, and the ideology of the aristocracy, etc. This is what happened in England in 1680, 1648, in France in 1789, in the USA in 1776, although the USA didn't really have a feudal class, but they, they revolted against the uh, British aristocracy. So these are the bourgeois democratic revolution. And here's the Junkers path. All right, so here's the Junkers path where the feudal aristocracy itself becomes uh, more capitalist. There is no revolution as such. Uh, and the West, some vestiges of feudalism, its culture, its politics, its ethos remain there but are reformed in light of how to modernize, et cetera, et cetera. Why did Germany take this particular path, or Prussia rather take this particular path? It did so under the influence of the French Revolution. That as Napo after the French Revolution, Napoleon comes to power and he tries to conquer uh, all of Europe. And uh, European monarchies at the time are forced to modernize along the lines of the French Revolution, but without undertaking a revolution itself. So, uh, so land reforms were considered part of this method of modernization. Bhutto sees we can, we can situate it in that particular path. So the burden of this kind of modernization and technological change would be placed on the landlord and you know the, the incentive structure would be created to move capitalism, sorry, to move feudal, the feudal agrarian political economy into a modern capitalist society. The logic though of Bhutto's reform is not at all dissimilar from Ayub's reform. Both of them are uh, imposing a ceiling. You have a question? So there was a whole a, a, a body of literature before the Green Revolution, especially, that that uh, suggested that there was a positive correlation, or a, sorry, a negative correlation between farm size and efficiency per acre output. So smaller farms were seen to be more efficient, in fact, than larger farms. And the reason that was the case, uh, it was alleged, was because when you had a big feudal lord, landlord, etc., they had lo lots and lots of land. So they planted more, they could plant more sparsely. Uh, they didn't have to utilize the land so intensely. Whereas if you had 25 acres of land or 30 acres of land, you wanted to get the highest output from that land in order to, you know, compete in the market, etc., etc. So you planted much more intensely. You took care of the crop much more intensely, and so on and so forth. So there was a huge amount of literature in the 1960s even, which suggested that smaller farms are more efficient. But this relationship becomes reversed after the Green Revolution because the, the new technology, which uh, may not increase per acre yield, but certainly increases productivity, both of, uh, you know, in terms of uh, capital output ratios, um, uh, uh, does not, the, the, the correlation between, you know, sort of uh, smaller farms and higher per, ye ye per acre yield <coughs> breaks down after the Green Revolution because Green Revolution technology is not scale neutral. It will basically be applied on larger farms rather than smaller ones. Technology generally is not scale neutral in agriculture. So as technology comes into the framework, that old relationship breaks down. Contributing to productivity efficiency. 
reforms. Which reforms? Land reforms? Right, so the idea was that uh, the, the la very, very large land landlords had vast tracts of land which they were not utilizing productively. So many of them had 7,000 acres, 5,000 acres, even more than that, etc. But they were only planting on a certain area. The rest of them were used as shikargas and they were used as, you know, just sort of general land of the landowner without being productively utilized. So the, the essential argument both of the Ayub as well as of the Bhutto reforms were that you're not really using this land, you know, intensively as an economic resource. It's just lying around. So, you know, you take the 150 or 500 of 150 acres you want, give us the rest, we'll give it to the poor farmers, etc. They will utilize it better, increasing productivity. So that was the economic argument uh, behind land reforms. <coughs> and, and not an unimportant one, I think, right? So, okay, to continue, um, the, uh, what were the results of Ayub's land reforms? We, uh, we should ask this question. Because Ayub also had land reforms with the same intention of modernizing agriculture, getting more output out of it. So what were the results? Well, the government survey in 1968 found that the largest landowners continued to cultivate the bulk of their holdings with tenants and bullocks. It was the smaller owners who adopted the new tractor technology. So it wasn't the very large owners who, who, who modernized as a consequence of the 59 land reforms. Owners of more than 200 acres each owned about 78% of all land held by tractor owners in, in 1968, but owned only 34% of the tractors. So they, they had 78% of the land, they should have had 78% of the tractors, but actually they had 34% of the tractors. Owners between 26 and 100 acres each own 9.5% of the land, but 35% of the tractors, nearly as much as those who had more than 200 acres. So you see that people who had thousands of acres were not highly likely to modernize in that way. And that is one of the main, these sorts of findings were some of the main reasons behind why Bhutto wanted to impose the land ceiling at 150 and 200 acres, is because he did not see the very largest landowners as being productive, uh, as increasing output. So similarly with respect to tractor owners, those with more than 200 acres of land owned only 14% of tube wells, but 78% of the land. Tractor owners between 13 and 100 acres owned 63% of tube wells and, uh, on only 21.5% of the land. So again, when we look at tube wells, etc., we find the exact same pattern, that tube wells are being sunk not by the biggest landowners, but by the middle tier is more likely to go for tractors and more likely to go, likely to go for tube wells than the, than the very, very big landowners. So the 1972 census of agriculture shows about 16,000 private farms that were in excess of 150 acres. MLR 115 will impact 16,000 landowners. That's 16,000 families, basically. They represent 0.5% of farms covered in the census. So very, very small, not even 1%. Not even the top 1%. Such farms covered 9% of the farm area and 5% of the cultivated area. So they were, these people are 0.5% of the rural agrarian economy, but they have about 9-10% of the land. So it's, so it's an important part. The ratio of uncultivated to cultivated land was thus quite high on the large holdings. Mm -hmm. This again is the reason for land reforms. Right? The large land holdings have a lot of uncultivated land. Whereas cultivated area constituted 83% of farm area for all holdings taken together. For the largest farm, that figure was only 46%. So ne almost half, right? Almost half of the, of the area of the big landowners is actually being cultivated. Whereas for other farms, the, the, the ratio is up to 83%, much, much higher. So that's why, that's the economic logic behind land, land reforms. That the large landowners are not really effectively utilizing the land. In 1972, moreover, we find that 30% um, uh, of the large farms, or, or sorry, of all Pakistani farms employed casual wage, wage labor. Of the largest farms, 56%, 56%, uh, sorry, 50.6% employed casual lab labor. 45% of the largest farms reported permanent wage labor. Uh, in terms of percentage of cropped area treated with fertilizers and pesticides, largest holdings are the most modern. But by 1972 now, we're seeing very different statistics from the one we've seen earlier in the 1960s. There is also vigorous participation of land rentiers in capital markets. 36% of the large rentiers utilize institutional credit, supplying 61% of their credit needs. Clearly, Herring says, capitalism as defined by the rough structural criteria of the use of wage labor is now 
by 1972 quite well established. Very large estates sometimes seem more rather than less capitalist than small farms. They may not be as intense as the small farms, but it's not altogether clear, uh, says Herring, in, by 1972, that they are any less capitalist, although that's what it seemed like a few years ago. So Herring says size of production is not an adequate proxy for organization of production in either the technical or the social sense, especially when we come down to the middle tier. Right? At the very large level, this is true. But when we come into the 50-acre category, 100-acre category, there the lines become much more blurred. Uh, also, there were vast implementation problems, as was pointed out by many people on this side of the panel in the previous discussion. Um, First of all, the, uh, um, uh, the de facto ceiling, if you calculate the ceiling in terms of produce index unit, is much, becomes much higher than 150 acres. There are many loopholes through, uh, in, through which you can save your land. Uh, land records could be concealed. Uh, they could be made forgeries of. Even oral gifts were permissible, and I think still are permissible under the law. Under Islamic law, you can make an oral gift. So you can say, oh, that's not my land anymore. I gave it to my son. Right? Uh, or I gave it to somebody else. Land was distributed in the name of bogus tenants, etc. So all of this was done to av avoid land reforms. The Federal Land Commission was uh, in charge of ensuring that these land reforms would uh, take place. Well, that's a picture of the Federal Land Commission taken in 2015. Um, and um, uh, so government tried now to stop these forgeries, etc. Um, by saying that all transfers of land in excess of the ceiling after December 20th, 1971 would be void unless they could provide a, you know, sort of a, a, a foundation, a basis of why that had been done. 1,200 owners were caught for having, um, you know, uh, uh, failed, sorry, to file declarations after the transfer of land. So if you transfer land, then you have to file a declaration. But a lot of people didn't file that declaration. So then the transfer of us was considered bogus. 3,265, five faced, were convicted of having fraudulently transferred uh, their land. Legislation in the 72 reform also allowed landowners to choose what land they gave to the government and what land they retained. And of course, as was the case in 1959, the le least productive land was handed over to the government rather than the most productive one. And then after the land reforms were said and done, Yes, it's true that landowners many oftentimes took the land back uh, by force, etc. There were also other problems. What, where is the area taken was 2.5% of total farm area. 40% of that area came from the 1959 land reforms. Less than 10% of tenant farmers received uh, compensation via the 1972 land reforms. Of course, land symbolizes prestige, etc. So when we're looking at the 1972 land reforms, in my view, the, one of the most interesting aspects of the 1972 land reform is to assess regionally its uh, relative impact. So its relative impact, in fact, in Punjab and Sindh is very, very moderate. But its impact in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Balochistan is disproportionately high. So, for example, the Land Disputes Inquiry Commission is set up in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, and in KPK, almost one third of total landless tenants in the province receive some form of land. This raises the question that was this land reform really aimed against the National Awami Party? Because the National Awami Party had a concentration of big landowners, etc., and the land that was taken away was taken in the in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa belonged to the National Awami Party. The National Awami Party of yesterday, of course, is the Awami National Party of today. It's the same party. It had to change its name because it was declared illegal um, uh, in the 1970s. Twelve percent of farm area in KPK is confiscated. It's pretty, high, pretty high compared to Punjab and Sindh. Three-fourths of it is redistributed. And especially Swat, Chitral, Deer, you have about 50,000 families settled on the land. That's a huge number. And I'm very interested in Swat, to be honest, because that's where you get the Taliban insurgency. Right? And it would be very interesting to, to, to try and see. Well, Swat had this massive settlement of families back in the 70s. What is the relationship between fundamentalism in Swat, uh, the Taliban in Swat, and the families that were resettled versus the families that lost out, 
how does that scenario play itself out? Interesting question. Secondly, Balochistan, the Sardari system is completely abolished by the government. 10% of farm area is expropriated, very similar to Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, where you have 12%. The largest area of land is conf that is confiscated by the government in any province is confiscated in Balochistan. 36% of landless tenants in the provinces, province benefit from this land reform. That's very high. 30, uh, one third of landless pe people in Balochistan benefit from the 1972 land reforms. Half a million acres in Patfeeder is given to poor peasants. And uh, Baloch uh, tribal leaders, many of them are uh, prosecuted under the law for owning you know, uh, 4,000 acres of land, etc., etc. This sets up a very interesting question for me. Uh, two questions that come up. Was it that the higher sort of uh, implementation of land reforms in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Balochistan, was it that it was, it was designed this way because this, this would help to eliminate Bhutto's opponents? That's one argument. But now let's go to the other side and examine this, the scenario from the other side of the picture. Is it that resistance to uh, uh, People's Party government and the rise of ethnic nationalism, led mainly by, of course, by, uh, by tribal and landowning leaders, right? Is, uh, and the, and the, the accusation of Punjabi dominance is actually to cover up uh, the fact that they don't want to part with their own land under the new MLR 115 regulation. So is it that nationalism becomes a cover to hold on to land, as of course Zulfikar Ali Bhutto alleges. He says, the reason why all these NAP people are against my government is because they want to save their lands. They want to save the Sardari system. I've challenged the Sardari system. Is that the case? Or is it that he's mainly trying to attack his opponents? This makes for a very interesting argument. I don't know the answer, but I think it's an interesting question to pursue. So in the People's Party itself, by 1977, there is a feudal domination. Uh, remember when I was answering your question, I was telling you that in 1967, the People's Party was mainly led by uh, sort of uh, middle class urban intellectuals. By 1977, this has undergone a rapid transformation. Bhutto, much like uh, uh, Imran Khan, said, well, I need to get the electables into my party. And uh, in 1977, 14 out of the 22 federal ministers, three out of the four chief ministers, and three out of the four governors belonged to the feudal class. So his party, to a very large extent, was not ready to go along with the reforms that he himself was uh, wanting to implement. Yes. So, tenancy reforms, very, very important part of the land reform. Where you have tenants, what happens to them? So one of the key things is that Section 25 of MLR 115 says it prohibits the eviction of tenants. You cannot get rid of a tenant just because you feel like it. Or you can only get rid of them if they default on rent or they made, did something bad with the land, made it unfit for cultivation. Moreover, the passbook, which is a record, small record book of uh, the area surrounding, could be used as a title deed, and banks could give small farmers loans on the basis of that passbook. It's very important to understand this aspect as well. There are a lot of times why small tenants and far farmers, owners, etc., cannot get access to credit is because they have no paperwork. So Bhutto made that paperwork much, much easier. And recovery of loans was also much easier on longer sort of easy installments. So owners before 20, below 25 acres of land were exempted from almost all taxes. That's 80% of, of uh, all uh, you know, agriculturalists in all over the country. Uh, but the loophole was that rents could, uh, could be increased by owners at their own whim. And this would make tenancy reforms irrelevant, although there is a Tenancy Act in 1950 which limits rents to 50, 40%, but really his sub is 50%. So these things remain, you know, uh, are not really strongly implemented. And in fact, tenant eviction did increase after Bhutto's land reforms uh, because tenants were being pushed out and the land was being taken by owners to be productively farmed, et cetera, et cetera. Owner cultivation. So um, the enforcement of this Tenancy Act was to be undertaken by the Revenue Department. And Bhutto himself says that the Revenue Department is decadent, characterized by corruption, mischief, vendettas, harassment. So that's the department that he expects will undertake this particular reform. It's difficult. 
Uh, there were lots and lots of complaints against uh, tenancy eviction. In fact, over 19,000 in the Punjab alone. Oh, sorry, 83% of those were in the Punjab alone. 70% of those cases were in fact uh, uh, ruled in favor of the poor tenants and said the tenants should not be evicted. But only six cases ended in a conviction. No one was ever punished for evicting a poor tenant. So in 1977, Bhutto undertakes a second reform. This time he reduces the ceiling from 150 to 100 acres and 200 acres for non-irrigated land. But this is a compensated land reform. Rupees 30 per PIU is offered. And this, of course, is at the eve of the election. He announces the land reform and goes into the election. So the land reform really is not implemented at the time that he announces it. It's passed as a law, but its implementation remains to be done. It's passed in 1976, uh, you know, and it's supposed to be implemented in 77, and he calls a quick election. He, he actually calls an election one year before he, the election is due, um, in the hopes that this new land reform will win him millions and millions of votes. But it is not implemented, because as things turned out, turn out, after the election, the results of the election are contested by Bhutto's opponents that have come together in one formation called the Pakistan National Alliance, PNA. Uh, that includes Muslim League and the uh, ri religious right-wing parties, but it also includes ANP, etc. So they contest the results of the election and they do what Imran Khan recently did, which is they start having dharnas upon dharnas upon dharnas upon dharnas, big protests, and they say, we don't accept the results of the election. When they continue to have these dharnas upon dharnas, the army, they also call for, for example, Air Marshal Azhar Khan, one of the leaders of the PNA, calls for the army to step in and to do away with Bhutto's government, which is what the army then does. It steps in and says, look, the PNA and PPP are unable to reconcile with each other. That's why the army has had to step in. We have no, at, at first he says, we have no interest in this or that, etc. Uh, you know, we just want to restore order. There's too much chaos in the country, too many protests, etc. And as soon as order is restored, we will hold the election. And the initial promise is not even what you heard months. It's like sort of, you know, 90 days, we're just going to fix this and then we're going to go. That turns into an 11 year dictatorship. When Bhutto does take power, then a trial is opened up against, sorry, when Zia takes power, a trial for murder is opened up against Bhutto, and he is punished and hanged, so then there's no question of going back to anything. And, uh, you know, um, that's all pretty much a closed case that uh, Bhutto can return to power, uh, or even, frankly, that People's Party can return to power. So 11 years, then you have martial law, etc. cetera. Uh, so in the second round, uh, I think in the debate the other day, somebody said the second land reform was much more effective. I'm not sure whether they meant by second the 1972 one or they meant by second the 77 one. The 77 one is like technically the third, right? It's the second undertaken by Bhutto. But this, the second undertaken by Bhutto, that is the 77 one, was never implemented at any level, at any significant level whatsoever. It's a dead letter. So, um, in any case, uh, he's, uh, the author says, very little cultivatable land would have changed hands even now with the new ceiling, because it's still pretty, pretty, pretty high, uh, you know, and so on. Uh, but there could have been 250,000 families that could have benefited, um, but it would not have done anything for the 2.55 million other families. It's still very, very, very moderate as a reform. Um, right, all right, so to continue. Now, we have understood that feudalism causes economic stagnation. Many people think that uh, the reason why Europe uh, remained in the Dark Ages was as a consequence of mainly of uh, feudal stagnation. <coughs> it can also cause disintegration in the sense that uh, um, uh, disintegration of, the, of a state as well, because a capitalist state is actually far more centralized than a feudal state where feudal lords are relatively speaking, autonomous in their own areas. And it can be tyrannical and oppressive, etc. So when in Europe, the capitalist class overthrew the feudal lords, Lenin writes about them that they were compelled to be courageous. But this is only the case where the bourgeoisie has not been, in his own words, territorialized. What does this mean? What this means is that where capitalist relations have not yet spread to agriculture, there, the bourgeoisie is quite keen on land reform and on, 
you know, eliminating the power of their political class rival, which is the aristocracy, the nobility, the badshahat, etc., etc. But where capitalism spreads into agriculture, and the agricultural ruling class is also really capitalist, there, you know, give or take, give or take, <coughs> there the bourgeoisie is not so ready to challenge the landholding class because A, it's already become capitalist, and B, there is another reason as well, which is what Marx talks about, which is in practice he lacks courage for an attack on one form of property, that is private property in the conditions of labor, because this would be very dangerous for another form. In other words, if you undertake land reform, if you say, uh, imagine the difficulties of, let's say, a, a bourgeois democratic politician, right? If I am, if I am a pro-capitalist but anti-feudal politician, and if I say, you know, I want capitalist modernization, I want to have these land reforms or land to the tiller, and I take away private property from big feudal lords and I give it to the peasants, the workers in urban areas may look at that and say, well done, now let's do that with respect to the factories. Let's take away the property of the capitalists and let's have socialist factories. So it's very difficult, Marx and Lenin say, to quarantine the class struggle in one part of society and for it not to spread. And that's the danger, right? For as far as a capitalist is concerned. Hence, where capitalism becomes territori territorialized, agriculture becomes capitalist, the urban bourgeoisie will not be courageous, radical, or whatnot, or revolutionary. It will be more and more mild, moderate, and so on. So Lenin writes, in the epoch of the bourgeois revolution, the bourgeoisie has not yet territorialized itself. And that's why uh, you know, it's, it's very courageous. But in Pakistan, if we agree with Zedi that agriculture is already moving towards capitalism from the 1860s onwards, right, where the Permanent Settlement Act occurs in Punjab as well as in Sindh, then we can understand why urban politicians are unlikely to be strong advocates of a land reform or of the elimination of feudalism in the context of Pakistan because, well, because capitalism is already sweeping, sweeping into or seeping into rural areas. There's no real need from their point of view of having land reforms because there is no aristocracy in the old sense as it existed, let's say, in Europe, which is opposing the rise of capitalism uh, or contesting it at, at, at any level. So um, Bhutto's reforms, therefore, to conclude, were not really meant to eradicate feudalism, but to nudge them into the fold, the fold of being, uh, uh, being comprised of progressive enlightened gentry who invest in their land, don't abuse the, the, the feudal lords, and basically just modernize a little bit. That's his real in intention. Now, what happens after Bhutto? So as you know, MLR 115, uh, now I'm going to the third article, which is Islamization of Real Estate, Preemption and Land Reforms in Pakistan by Charles Kennedy. Very interesting article. It's a bit, uh, you know, sort of uh, on, the, on the legal side of things. It's, it's, if, you're a, if you're a law major, you'll really enjoy it. But it's very, very interesting. Um, so the MLR 115 under Section 25 had the idea of preemption, the right of preemption. What first right of preemption? What is first right of preemption, it's very important to understand this, is that the tenant has the first right to, uh, to buy, sell, refuse to buy, sell, etc. that land. If you're going to sell that land, who has the first right to buy it, purchase it? The tenant has the first right. So this is a very, very, very key part of the land reform that even if you wanted to get rid of that land, you have to give it to your mazara. The mazara has the first right to that particular land. So. Um, so in 1978, Ziaul Haq created four Shariat benches of the High Court. They were, you know, Punjab, NWFP, Balochistan, and Sin. He created Shariat courts. They didn't exist before that. And um, immediately in in Northwest Frontier Province, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, the Niamatullah actually Niamatullah basically filed a petition against this preemption uh, and MLR 115. And the NWFP bench, uh, Shariat bench, basically said, Islam does not allow right to preemption. The Chief Justice was Abdul Hakim Khan. He ruled that preemption was repugnant to Islam and therefore void. 
It's a very important case. Now what you're saying to explain this to you is that what was there in the political arena, land reform versus those who were saying no land reform, moves now onto the field of the law, moves into the, into the courts. The whole, this whole political, or this whole question of political economy now moves away from parliament and into the courts. The courts are now educating whether a, an economic policy undertaken by the government is allowable or not. Ziaul Haq then in 1980 dissolved these four Sharia courts. They existed for about what, two years, etc. And then he created one big federal Sharia court out of them uh, in 1980. The interesting thing is, now we often think, when we think of the federal Sharia court and Ziaul's Islamization and so on, we often think that its main objective was to prevent westernization of uh, you folks, etc. Right? Um, for example, um, you know, that uh, Islamization had to be undertaken, women should wear the dubatta, uh, you know, hadood laws should be implemented. Those are the issues taken up, you know, by the Women's Action Forum, for example, and have been very predominant, and by urban progressives, and have been very predominant in our, in our imagination about what the Ziyar regimes stood for and what those who opposed it stood for. But here's the more interesting aspect, an aspect that's been neglected in my view in this entire narrative that we've spoken about where you have uh, the Ziyar regime and you have the opponents against it. Some of the main issues over why the federal Sharia courts are at first at the provincial level and then at the federal level are created is the question of land. That's very, very central to uh, what's going on in the federal Sharia court. For example, 55%, over 55% of Sharia petitions to the Federal Sharia Court dealt with land cases in 79-80. MLR 115, Land Reform Act of 1977, Punjab Preemption Act of 1913, much older. So there's actually a historical precedent for preemption. Under the British, preemption laws also existed that if you want to sell your land, you have to sell it to the person who's actually working it first and foremost. Um, similar sort of uh, things exist, for example, if you want to sell your land, your neighbor, you know, uh, first right of refusal type things like that, even in urban land, etc. And there was another act in 1950, the NWFP Preemption Act, in, uh, oh, but these were all challenged in the Federal Sharia Court. And what did the Federal Sharia Court say? Well, the Niamat Ali um, uh, case was now uh, taken by... Uh, became a collective case under the Hafiz Muhammad Amin case, which, is, which was a sort of case dealing with all the petitions collectively together. And what did the case say? Well, Justice Aftab Hussain ruled on behalf of the majority bench that Islam recognizes the validity of state-imposed limits. So, so this time the verdict was actually different. This, and it was a split, very tiny split verdict. It said, no, in the public welfare, there is evidence the, in the hadith and in other places, that the government, the state, has had the right to say, to impose ceilings or to change things, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in the larger public interest. So it's not there is a historical precedent for it in Islamic history. It cannot be declared null and void. However, at the same time, the federal Sharia court also ruled that it did not have the authority to review decisions of the high courts. That is the, of course, it has. Uh, uh, authority to review decisions of the High Court generally, but of the federal Sharia uh, benches of the High Court. The federal Sharia will not have the, uh, that right, federal Sharia Court. And moreover, it will not have the right to deal over, quote unquote, constitutional or more importantly, economic matters. So it didn't have any teeth to implement this. Hence, the Niyamatullah ruling uh, stayed, uh, stood its ground and was not overturned by this federal Sharia Court. Verdict. So this gets a bit complicated because lawyers can be really complicated. Are there any lawyers in the house today? Good. So lawyers can, you know, they can be really, they can say, yes, this is true, but because of XYZ clause, it's not true, and because of ABC clause. Anyway. So what basically happened after that is in June 1980, the Council of Islamic Ideology came into the picture. And after examining the rulings of 1,500 judges and advocates and ulema and members of the public, etc., etc., it ruled very strongly in favor of the Niyamatullah decision. It said, quote, uh, draft law of preemption 1982 was declared uh, as un-Islamic and uh, 
uh, tenants have no right of preemption. It, therefore, the CII ruling, Council of Islamic Ideology, overruled MLR 115, overruled Landform Act of 1977, overruled the Punjab Preemption Act of 1913, overruled the NWFP Preemption Act of 1950. All the historical precedent was thrown aside and they said it's wrong. So one of the key things behind the creation of the Islamic courts really is the land question, not so much other questions ke chand, Eid ka chand dekhne ke liye kya karna padega wagaira, you know? Okay, then the appellate bench of the uh, uh, Shariat uh, Court, of the Supreme Court, have examined the same case. This is the Sayyid Kemal Shah petition. And uh, the Shariat appellate bench also ruled the Haji Niyamutullah case <coughs> should stand. It also said, it was appealed. In its appeal also, they said, the decision is correct. To have an, any land ceiling is un-Islamic. Again, all the precedents are thrown out and the judgment explicitly said that none of these would have any legal effect. That's in July 1986. N uh, NWFP assembly quickly passed a resolution um, uh, uh, which said, uh, passed an act, sorry, which was the Preemption Act 1987. And this is pretty much identical to the Council of Islamic Ideology's point of view. And of course, NWFP provincial assembly at the time was dominated by landlords who had been impacted by Bhutto's 1972 land reform, whose land was taken away and given to peasants. Um, similarly, the Punjab preemption pre ordinance was passed in 1990. It's a, identical to this act, but this was not an act, it was an ordinance. So Punjab uh, provincial assembly also then passed an act in 1991, but Punjab remained somewhat lukewarm on the implementation of this particular thing. And um, so now the net result of this since 1986 is that, uh, the, that all these cases have to go into the court and the court has basically declared that land reform is un-Islamic. This is one of the key reasons behind why Zia opts for the particular strategy, in my view, of Islamization because it impacts not just a small urban professional, uh, not just a couple of hundred thousand, maybe a million to professional women or men. This, imp this is a question of millions of people, you know, across Pakistan that really is the vast majority of the population. Then next we have the very famous Kizilbash Waqf case, uh, which is that, um, again, that MLR 115 is un-Islamic. Now the case here was that the land taken by the Kizilbash family uh, was, they said, Waqf land, which is basically uh, should come under a, cha a charitable trust. It's not private property in the, in the sense of belonging to a person. It's the land of a waqf on which people work, etc., and use, utilize that. So why was that? Under, why was land reform undertaken in that particular instance? Land ceiling of any type places an undue restriction on the rights of property holders. It should not be considered Islamic. Provisions for the resumption of lands for livestock, orchards, and stud farms are not a valid exercise of state power. These should have been outside of land reforms in any case. Provisions prohibiting property owners from evicting tenants are an invalid intrusion upon private property. The sanctity of private property here is the key element of this entire case, petition. So the majority decision was in favor uh, of uh, the Kazalbash family. It said Islam requires, quote, mandatory leveling up with no mandatory leveling down. You should make the poor richer, but you can't make the rich uh, you know, sort of, you can't take away lands from the rich, etc. There was also a minority decision, which is Justice Naseem Hassan Shah, Justice Shafir Rahman, etc. They ruled that the state, not didn't, they didn't necessarily rule that what Bhutto had done was right. Please understand, but they did rule that the state does have the right to amend, alter uh, property in the interest, uh, in the in the broader public interest, which, of course, in my view, is. Uh, is absolutely true because if the state does not have the right to alter private property rights or uh, in, the, in the larger public interest, then that is a huge uh, limit on state power uh, and the state's ability to manage society, the economy, etc., etc. The Another interesting thing about this ruling is that this Kazilbash case ruling came 
when Benazir Bhutto's government was in power. And yet Benazir could do nothing against, not only could do nothing against this ruling, the entire legislature basically uh, just in cricket mein, uh, ball delivery aari, well left kar dete hain, they just left it. Uh, it goes to the wicket keeper. They didn't challenge it in any fundamental way. This represents a very important change in the PVP of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto and the PVP of Benazir Bhutto. That the, whereas the 70s PPP was saying land reform, break the power of the feudals, etc., etc. We are socialist, we're going to undo capitalism, whatever. The new PPP of Benazir Bhutto is saying that economic agenda is no longer basically on the table. Okay, so now that the Federal Shariat Court and the Shariat Appellate Bench have declared all of this illegal, what, what is the situation? Well, one thing to recognize is that most of these verdicts were split decisions. Three to two, three to two. If one judge had gone the other way, the verdict would have been gone the other way. In both the Said Kamal Shah and Kizil Bash work decision, there were three to two decisions. And the other thing to recognize is the National Assembly of Pakistan has never formally repudiated land reforms. And the reason is that the <coughs> demand for land reforms remains widely still quite popular, if not uh, supported by the majority. Um, so, Islamization, as I understand it, is very much deeply linked to the reversal of Bhutto's project of uh, changing uh, agri agrarian relations in, the, in Pakistan. It's a very central aspect. If you ignore that aspect, you cannot, in my view, understand why Ziaul Haq not only takes power, but remains in power for 11 years. He has sustained power to ensure that this challenge to private property, to feudalism, uh, etc., does not occur again. Uh, and the second conclusion that I think you can draw from this last section is that although we think that the judiciary became active and involved only with the lawyers movement, in fact there is evidence to show that the judiciary was already very, very overactive long before the lawyers movement. Um, the judiciary, especially in the form of the Shariat court, is setting, you know, is, is, is a place where you can go where, and challenge uh, the economic policy of, the, of, a, of a given government or the policy process of a particular government. So it's only one step from that that they are also then able to say that the government of Nawaz Sharif should, uh, is disqualified, etc., etc. So, and in relation to the judiciary, Pakistan's legislative and executive institutions, uh, you can see, remain, relatively speaking, quite powerless to challenge any of that or to create the law. So that's it. <laughs>